Good evening. Hi, I'm Jeff Sikinga, Executive Director of the Ashbrook Center. Uh, so glad that you could be with us for our second webinar in this series of his, on historic presidential elections. Um, this is brought to you by the Ashbrook Center. Um, and thanks also, of course, to our partners, Missouri Humanities, for co-sponsoring this event. Uh, the Ashbrook Center, as many of you know, is an independent educational center located at Ashland University. We run programs at Ashland University in Ashland, Ohio, but also across the country for students, teachers, and citizens. And uh, we think this webinar series is, is part of our mission, which is to, to educate our fellow Americans in the history and principles of our country, and, and by so doing, strengthen constitutional self-government in, in, in this nation. So thank you so much for joining us uh, for this second webinar in the series. Uh, tonight is Abraham Lincoln and the election of 1860. Uh, you know, we'll be having a conversation tonight, and that's not uh, an accident. The Ashbrook way of teaching and learning is to understand education, not as information, and definitely not as indoctrination, but as discovering. Discovering the truth for yourself about the history and principles of this country. Uh, we, we base all our programs on Aristotle's old uh, principle, which I've said many times, all people desire to know, and we add, but they don't want to be told. They want to discover it for themselves. So we're, we're going to pursue um, this a question tonight, which I think is, has a lot of contemporary relevance for us. And we really believe at Ashbrook that history can speak to us, that history is vital, it's alive, and we can go back to the past, we can ask it questions, we can seek its answers and discover some wisdom there, some insight uh, on our own contemporary situation, but also, of course, uh, renew our own understanding of America's principles. We really think more than ever, history matters. So we wanna thank you for joining us. We wanna thank the teachers who are joining us this evening through Teaching American History, a project of the Ashbrook Center. And again, thanks to our partners, Missouri Humanities for their generous partnership. I want to talk tonight uh, on this really interesting and important historical question with Dr. Jason Stevens. Jason is a professor of political science at Ashland University, where he has been now for a number of years. Uh, he himself actually was an undergraduate at Ashland University, received his bachelor's there, uh, was a scholar in the Ashbrook Scholar Program, which is a national honors program for history and political science students. Jason was one of those special students and, and has continued his wonderful academic trajectory. He got his master's and his PhD from the Institute for Philosophic Studies at the University of Dallas. And he has come back to us, we're delighted uh, by that, and come back to us now in, in the form of the being, becoming the director of teacher programs. So he helps guide all of Ashbrook's and TAH's interactions with teachers. Uh, he teaches in our Master of Arts uh, in American History and Government, uh, our graduate programs, and he also teaches in our Teaching American History one-day and multi-day seminars, which we take around the country to teachers where they are and study the great documents and questions of American history and government with them. So Jason directs those efforts, lead those efforts. He's a wonderful scholar. He's a wonderful teacher um, and, and a great colleague. And he's been really a, a wonder, wonderful addition to our team in TAH and has been continued to actively teach. He's teaching courses on the American founding, uh, on American foreign policy, and of course, of course on Abraham Lincoln, one of the students almost all time favorites. Uh, he won't say that, but I will. <laughs> and uh, he taught a really interesting course, uh, a graduate course called The Great Triumvirate, Clay, Calhoun, and Webster. Uh, Henry Clay, John C. Calhoun, and Daniel Webster, those great statesmen of American 19th century. And uh, particularly Henry Clay, who is so connected to Abraham Lincoln, of course, and also to Ashland uh, University in the town of Ashland, which was named, in fact, after Henry Clay's estate in Kentucky, which was called Ashland. So if you ever see Ashland cities or counties around the country, that's the influence of Henry Clay right there. Jason's area of scholarly expertise and his, his research and work 
have been primarily in Abraham Lincoln's foreign policy, which is uh, 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 somewhat understudied in many ways and neglected uh, aspect of Abraham Lincoln's public career and presidency, but it played a really vital role during the Civil War. And Jason is a real expert on that and really on the whole career of Abraham Lincoln. So we thought, what better person to have this conversation with tonight than Dr. Stevens? I think the big question for, for me, Jason, is um, what does the election of 1860 show us about America? The enduring principles of America, perhaps the enduring problems that America confronts. So it's important in its day and time, of course, in setting up the Civil War, which follows right after. But I think it has resonance past that, perhaps even now into 2020. But I wanted to start um, by, if you wouldn't mind, taking us back a little bit. Uh, take us back before 1860. Start with us when young Abraham Lincoln. What's Abraham Lincoln doing before uh, the, say, he gets back into politics in 1854? What's he doing before 1854 in his life? And what gets him back into politics in that year? Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, thanks a lot for having me, uh, Jeff. It's a it's a delight to be here uh, and to speak with all the the teachers and and students and and citizens in our audience. Um, I know that personally, every every four years or so, when when the presidential elections uh, come around, there is uh, this tendency to uh, to maybe be a bit pessimistic, to 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 lose hope for the sake of the future of the country. I know uh, a lot of folks. Um, are feeling that now, especially. But in my mind, I, I always go back to two pivotal elections in American history. Uh, one of them is what you, uh, you talked about uh, with Dr. Rogers uh, at Vashland University last week, uh, the election of, of 1800, which was significant in its own right because for the first time in, in world history, you have one political party or the representative of one political party lose an election and voluntarily step aside without any bloodshed. Adams loses to Thomas Jefferson. A Federalist loses to a Democratic Republican. Uh, the opposition party wins the election and there is a peaceful transition of power. That had never happened before in the world's history. Um, ballots had come to replace bullets, as Lincoln will describe it in his July 4th speech of 1861, ballots had replaced bullets as the ultimate deciders of political contest. Um, that's an American thing. That is a distinctly American thing. And that gives us, that gives us hope. I think that the history of America shows the ability to, to overcome uh, any, any differences or any obstacles that we may face as, as one people, as the Declaration of Independence puts it. Uh, and every four years, you know, we we sort of uh, we may get uh, frustrated with the the campaigning and the politicking and the, the the vitriol that's thrown back and forth from time to time. That happened in 1800. Um, yeah, that happened in in 1860. And so this is this is nothing nothing new that we're experiencing. Um, and I I also like to keep in mind um, the uh, the maxim from. Federalist number one and what Alexander Hamilton had to say about accident and uh, force and accident versus reflection and choice. Because even when we see the vitriol that takes place sometimes on the campaign trail, whether that's between John Adams and Thomas Jefferson or, or anybody else in the modern day, um, even at its worst, that is still a product of reflection and choice. We haven't reverted back to accident and force. In other words, Right. Things could be a lot worse. At least we're not killing each other. That is what we face in the aftermath, though, of the election of 1860. Um, what is most significant about the election of, of 1860, that, that election, I think, expl explicitly turned on this question. Is slavery right or wrong? Or to maybe put it another way, that election explicitly turned on on the following question, do we still hold these truths to be self-evident? Those truths from the Declaration of Independence, the principle that all men are created equal and endowed by their creator with certain 
unalienable rights, and among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. It's the first time in American history that that question had been voted on right, in the history of our union. And I think Lincoln believed that everything else will follow from this question about the Declaration and the answer given by the people in the election. Um, but not to get ahead of ourselves too quickly here. So backing up a bit prior to, to 18, 1860, um, I mean, you know, we could, we could sit here all night and talk about, um, about Lincoln's uh, early life. Uh, in fact, uh, this Thursday, I'm, I'm having a movie night with a group of Ashbrook scholars. We're going to be watching the old John Ford classic, Young Mr. Lincoln. Uh, starring starring uh, Henry Fonda, which is just a, a wonderful, delightful film. We're going to have a conversation about about that movie and, and its significance and what it tells us about Abraham Lincoln's uh, life and, um, more importantly, his his statesmanship. Um, you know, Lincoln, he, he's, he's born poor in, in 1809 in Kentucky, uh, had less than a year of formal education. And I'm always amazed by that fact. Uh, Lincoln described his own education. He said he got it by littles. That was the phrase he used. He got his education by littles, meaning he picked up a little here and a little there. He was almost exclusively self-taught. He would read out loud. He would read everything out loud. He would read Shakespeare. His favorite play was Macbeth. Uh, he would read Euclid, Aesop, uh, Pilgrim's Progress, um, uh, biography of George Washington, who was his political hero. Um, he was, right, he was a self-taught, self-made man through and through, um, right? His example shows us that a man who will can get an education in this country, right, if he, if he sets his mind to it. Um, Lincoln, uh, you know, as he develops a taste for politics and the law, he's a lawyer by trade, of course. Um, he's uh, he considers himself an old line Whig, right? So the Whigs who right weren't around early in the the American Republic, right? Or you know, back in 1800, it was the Federalists versus the Democratic Republicans, as I said. Uh, but the Whigs begin to emerge as a political party. Uh, during the age of Jackson, they rise in, in opposition to to Andrew Jackson and some of the, the many famous early leaders of, of the Whig Party, um, who you mentioned in your introductory remarks, Henry Clay of, of Kentucky, who Lincoln called his beau ideal of a statesman. He said of Henry Clay, he's my beau ideal of a statesman, and that he, he loved his country. He, Henry Clay, loved his country partly because it was his own country, but mostly because it was a free country. And Lincoln, I think, felt the same way. Uh, Daniel Webster, another uh, another uh, early uh, leader, um, both, of w both of whom, by the way, would pass away the same year in 1852, uh, which was a bad year, a really bad year for the Whigs. Um, and so Lincoln considers himself an old line Whig, so uh, he's a fan of the American system, so you know, protective tariffs, internal improvements, a national bank, and anti-slavery uh, against the extension of, of slavery into the territories in particular. Um, Lincoln serves one short term in, in Congress in the late 18, 1840s as a, as a Whig. Um, the dominant political issue of that time was the, the Mexican-American War. Lincoln delivers a, a speech on the, 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 uh, the House floor uh, on, that, on that conflict. Uh, he writes up a series of you know, what came to be known as spot resolutions, which gave him the unflattering nickname uh, uh, of Spotty Lincoln by some of his, his political opponents. He serves two years relatively undistinguished in the House and then retires, um, returns to his, his law practice. At this point, he's living in, in Springfield, Illinois with his family, uh, and he is contented to live a, a relatively obscure life as a, as a country lawyer. Um, you know, bringing up his uh, bringing up his 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 children. It's not until the year 1854 that something happens that sends shockwaves through the nation, and 
was Lincoln's fire bell in the night moment, right? That thing that, that happened that awakened and filled him with terror. And he, he puts retirement aside. He comes out of political obscurity. He comes out of the political wilderness um, in order to oppose Stephen Douglas's Kansas Nebraska Act and the doctrine of popular sovereignty, um, which in regards to the question of slavery, which had always sort of divided the nation, uh, you know, Stephen Douglas, the little giant, his doctrine of popular sovereignty said, their slavery is voted up or voted down in the territories, but just let the people of the territories decide for themselves whether or not they want slavery. And we'll call that self-government, Douglas says. And through that piece of legislation, which repeals the Missouri Compromise of 1820, which was a, a product of Henry Clay's statesmanship, um, the repeal of the Missouri Compromise of 1820 through the Kansas-Nebraska Act, this really fired up Lincoln. It fired up Lincoln because he believed that, that Douglas, as he said, as he put it, was trying to go back to the era of our revolution, trying to go back to the era of 1776 and attempting to blow out the moral lights around us. Attempting to make... That can, can, I, can I just, that's a really amazing phrase because you, what you're saying is Abraham Lincoln starts out as a Whig. He favors commerce and industry, uh, even though he's born poor on a farm, and maybe that's why. Mm -hmm. So he wants to sort of rise and he wants people to be able to rise. He thinks part of that rising is letting people keep the fruits of their labor in, no matter what their color is. So he's opposed to slavery. Right. As part of that general, if you work for it, you deserve to keep it. Kind yeah, of principle. absolutely. One of his one of his early experiences with, you know, understanding even as even as a young man, that slavery was fundamentally unjust because it violated those principles of the Declaration of Independence. When Lincoln was a young man, his father, Thomas, would loan him out to neighbors, to neighboring farms. Um, this was, you know, of course, when he was, you know, before he was 21, before he came of age, the law allowed them to do this. So Lincoln would go out, he'd work all day on the neighbor's farm. He'd come home with his earnings in his hand and his father would, would take, would take his earnings from him. Right. And Lincoln, looking back on that moment said, right, that's, that's when I, 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 I realized that, you know, it is a, a fundamental maxim that human beings have the right, that it is just to keep the fruits of their labor. So Lincoln thinks that's the fundamental, one of the great fundamental principles of America from all the way back in 1776. He thinks the country has abided by that, more or less, in making compromises with slavery, but, but, but never admitting the principle that slavery is okay or that the people can decide whether it's okay. You're saying in 1854, which is not a year I think most of us think is a big deal in American history. You know, we, we tend to think 1776 or 1861 and the Civil War. We don't really think 1854 is such a big deal. Um, the argument is over whether slavery should exist in the territories. And it tell us a little more. We got two political parties by this time, right? The Democrats and the Whigs. But in 1854, Stephen Douglas pushes this bill, which says, well, let the people of the territories decide whether slavery is OK. And, and what you're saying is Lincoln said his view was that's not something the majority has a right to say. That the majority yeah, it, has to there are certain principles of right and wrong that even the majority has to abide by. And slavery is wrong and no majority can say that it's right. Is that a fair way of, of thinking about Lincoln's views in 1854? Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, uh, you mentioned these compromises had been made with slavery uh, in 1850 and 1820 and going back to the, the Constitutional Convention of 1787. Um, but those were never compromises on the principle, the principles of the Declaration of Independence, particularly the principle that all men are created equal. In 1854, however, now you have Stephen Douglas saying that he doesn't care about that principle, that that principle is, is irrelevant, right? What he cares about is letting the people have the right to decide for themselves whether or not they want slavery or not. What he, and he calls this, right, the principle of consent 
and that is self-government, um, which of course is strange as you point out, it's the principle of equality that makes self-government possible or that requires then self-government. If all men are not created equal, then self-government does not, the principle of self-government falls by the wayside. You don't need consent if all men are not created equal. If all men are created equal, you must have consent. Um, and this, like I said, this, this fires Lincoln up because it took a moral issue that everybody cares about and said, this is an amoral issue. We shouldn't care whether or not slavery is, is right or wrong. Just let the people decide for themselves. Just let the majority determine what is right and what is wrong. Let the people vote. Let the people decide, which is a very democratic, small d, democratic principle. We often revert back to it today, and for good reason. Let, let the people decide. Let's put it to a vote. But Lincoln understood, right, there are some questions, some moral questions, right, that cannot be put to a vote. So Lincoln gets back into politics in 1854 it's the same year, and you had us look at, one of the documents you had us uh, look at was the Republican Party platform. Um, that's the same year, if I'm, if I'm not mistaken, that the Republican Party is formed. Okay, so talk, right. tell us a little bit about now as we move into 1854 and into the presidential election of 1856, how did Lincoln, you said he got fired up and got back into politics. What did he do? How did he get back into politics? And what was his role in the newly formed Republican Party? Yeah, yeah, you're exactly right. So the Republican Party is formed in 1854 after the Whigs had pretty much went the way of the dodo. Uh, 1852 uh, was a really, really bad year for the Whigs. They're trounced in the uh, the presidential election that year. Franklin Pierce just trounces the the Whig candidate Winfield Scott, um, and the Whigs had a had a long history of of really struggling to to elect presidents. Or if they were able to elect them, they would just quickly die in office, like William Henry Harrison uh, or Zachary Taylor. Um, and 1852 was also a really bad year because Clay and Webster pass away. Um, and the Whigs had, after, at that point, pretty much ceased to be a, a, a serious political force. Uh, and so the Republican Party uh, is formed in 1854 to, to fill that void, so to speak. Um, it's made up of, of old line Whigs. It's made up of, of Northern um, Democrats. Um, the, uh, the Republican Party and their initial platform of 1856, right, when they first field a Republican candidate for pre presidency, John Fremont, who ends up narrowly losing to James Buchanan, uh, in that 1856 party platform, um, the Republican Party, basically, they said our principle is we stand opposed uh, right, to those, those twin principles of, of barbarism, slavery and polygamy. Uh, slavery and polygamy. Um, and this was, you know, in 1856 and also in 1860, these political party platforms that I, that I included here from the Republicans and the Democrats, this was back in the day when the political party platforms actually mattered where people read the political party platforms and a lot of thought and work went into, into crafting these political party platforms. Um, they were relatively short, and what they had to say was pretty important, as opposed to today where nobody reads the political party platforms, not even the candidate elected on the platform reads the, reads the platform anymore. I remember in 1996, I think, Bob Dole was asked, who was, of course, the Republican candidate for president, he asked if he uh, supported the Republican party platform. And Dole's response was, I don't know. I haven't read it. <laughs> so Lincoln, does he take a role in forming the Republican Party? Because what you're saying is it's a it's a really dis diverse group, disparate group, maybe not a group you would normally put together under one political tent. Mm -hmm. But these groups that come together out of the crumbling of the Whigs and out of opposition, I guess, to the Kansas Nebraska Act, the idea of extending slavery into the territories, they kind of come together. Um, but Lincoln is, is a, as you said, a one term congressman, a country lawyer from from out in the Hicks, you know, the sticks out in Western Illinois is the way West in those days. Right. Yeah. So um, it doesn't sound like he's near the center of power for the Republicans. 
So how does Lincoln start to rise in the party in the 1850s, or does he remain obscure all the way up until almost 1860? Um, and I'm thinking here maybe even about the Lincoln-Douglas debates. Yeah, I mean, look, he, Lincoln is a leader of the Republican Party early on in, in Illinois, but, but nationally he is unknown. Nobody outside of Illinois knows who Abraham Lincoln is in the right in the mid 1850s. In 1854, the year that Douglas passes the Kansas-Nebraska Act and popular sovereignty, and the year that the Republican Party is formed, that's not a coincidence. It was the passage of Kansas-Nebraska that right was was the defining event that led to the creation of the new Republican Party that same year, which Lincoln then will uh, will quickly join. Um, nobody outside of Illinois knows who Lincoln is in 1854 when he is, begins speaking out uh, throughout the state against Kansas, Nebraska. Um, two things happen, though, in the, the, the latter part of that, that decade. One, you, you mentioned one of them, the, the Lincoln-Douglas debates, a series of seven debates with Stephen Douglas uh, for a Senate seat. Um, so Lincoln is challenging Douglas, uh, who where it was the current occupant of the, the Senate seat from from Illinois, and they agree to meet for these these seven debates. And these are these are nothing like the debates you see today uh, between candidates. First of all, this was just right for a, a right a, 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 a U.S. Senate seat, um, but you had these two men um, crisscrossing the state of Illinois, uh, north, south, and central. Um, in a series of seven joint debates that were, were three hours long. The first speaker would speak for an hour, the second speaker would speak for an hour and a half, and then the first speaker would return to the stage again to deliver a 30-minute rejoinder. So they would each speak for an hour and a half. They did this seven times, no moderators, nothing like that, um, and the debates were all on one question, slavery or specifically the, the extension of, of slavery into the territories. The other thing that happens is, um, or actually, let me, before I go on, say, Lincoln loses that election, of course, to, to Stephen Douglas in 1858, um, which, looking back on it, was probably a good thing, because if he had won, he's probably not the Republican candidate in 1860. Um, he loses that election, but Lincoln sees to it that those speeches are, are published, and disseminated throughout the Union. That series of seven debates, that contest with Douglas, begins to make Lincoln a, a nationally recognized political figure. The other thing that happens is the Cooper Union Address, where Lincoln goes to, to New York City, uh, which is William Henry Seward's territory, who was the presumptive nominee that the, all, that for, for the Republicans in, in 1860. Um, Lincoln goes to Cooper Union and he delivers just this masterful address on the meaning of the American founding and what it means for us um, in, in, 18, in, in the late 1850s. And it's there that, first of all, he makes himself known more throughout the nation in, in New York where nobody had heard of you know, Abe Lincoln. But he also successfully portrayed himself as the moderate candidate. Um, Seward had a reputation for sort of being a firebrand. Um, he was very, very sympathetic to, to the abolitionist. Um, he was seen, Seward was seen as an, an extreme candidate. Uh, he had delivered his irrepressible conflict speech, which seemed to suggest that, right, civil war is, is imminent uh, and that a Seward election will help bring on a civil war. And so Lincoln appears to many Republicans when he delivers Cooper Union as the less extreme alternative to a William Henry Seward, a more moderate candidate who's anti-slavery, but his position is that the federal government has no authority to do anything about slavery in the states where it currently exists, but that it does have the authority and that it ought to exercise that authority to prevent the spread of slavery into the territories. As Lincoln said in his first inaugural address, which I, I think I included on the document list, he says there's only one difference between North and South. There's only one significant difference between us. And that difference is that we think slavery is wrong and ought to be restricted, and they think slavery is right and ought to be extended. 
that's the only significant dispute between us. So you've got Abraham Lincoln positioning himself in the 1850s, trying to walk this fine line, right, of being, as you say, anti-slavery on principle, opposing the spread of slavery in the West, but mm -hmm. also saying, but, but we shouldn't interfere with slavery in the South where it exists, mm -hmm. in states where it exists. Mm -hmm. That probably doesn't sound very good to abolitionist types. Yeah, abolitionists were, I mean, when Lincoln is the candidate in 1860, abolitionists are not very happy with Lincoln. And in fact, they won't be very happy with him for, for part of his presidency, uh, the early part. Um, right, they wanted more of a more of a firebrand, like a like a Seward or uh, or somebody else. Um, so yeah, Lincoln does not, you know, he he does not hitch a ride here on the right on the abolition train. Um, he is he is not looking to position himself as this extreme candidate, but he takes the much more prudent position. And by the way, the more electable position that he does on slavery, being anti-slavery in principle. Right? He says, if slavery is not wrong, nothing is wrong. As I would not be a master, so I would not be a slave. This is my understanding of democracy. Anything that departs from that to the extent of the difference is no democracy. Right? He's anti-slavery his entire life, has always hated and despised the thing right, since he was a young man. Um, but he also realized that there right, were restrictions to what the federal government can do about slavery, um, which is why he believes there's right, – there's, that, that Congress doesn't have, for example, the power to eliminate slavery in the states where it already exists. But it can and ought to prevent the spread of slavery because, again, we believe in that, that natural Republican majority on the basis of the Declaration of Independence that all men are created equal. So this is a very complex, nuanced understanding of the problem of slavery that Lincoln has. Right, because on the one hand, you have abolitionists saying slavery is evil. Let's use all power, including the federal government, to get rid of it. On the other hand, by the time you get to the late 1850s, you have the pro-slavery types saying slavery is good, and let's use the power of the federal government to extend it everywhere. Mm -hmm. And you've got these two extremes, and you've got people in the middle like Lincoln who are trying to maintain the principle that slavery is wrong, which agrees with the abolitionists, of course, but but also that the federal government has limited power to, to act on it in the states, but can prevent it in the Western territories. But as someone asked, has already asked in the questions, a very astute question, one of our, our uh, listeners has said, but what about this famous Supreme Court case, Dred Scott? That happens in 1857, and it seems like the Supreme Court injects itself into this really tense national argument over slavery to try and settle the question. For, so for some of us who aren't as familiar with Dred Scott, tell us about that case very briefly and tell us what effect it had and, and what Lincoln thought about it. Yeah, that is a great question. Um, Dred Scott v. Sanford in 1857, uh, Dred Scott, a slave, sues for his freedom after his uh, owner had taken him into a free territory, then a free state. Um, and the Supreme Court sides against Dred Scott. Uh, in a 7-2 decision, there are two dissenters, McLean and, and Curtis, so it's not a unanimous decision, which is really important for Lincoln. But Roger Taney, Chief Justice Roger Taney, a Jackson employee, I believe, um, he asserts in his opinion, which still to this day, by the way, I think is, it still holds the record as the longest Supreme Court opinion in, America's, in American history. Right? So if you ever assign selections of, of Dred Scott to your students in your classrooms, it's always a good idea to, to maybe just give some excerpts instead of the whole thing. It's a beast. Um, but Tani said in that decision, uh, right, very, the very infamous decision, that the, that the black man has no rights which the white man is bound to respect, and that the, the Constitution and the Declaration of, of Independence right, are great pro-slavery documents, that the Declaration of Independence, when the founders said all men are created equal, they did not mean to include the black man. This decision emboldens the Deep South because now the Supreme Court has said that they have a constitutional right to slavery. The Supreme Court has, has come out in, in favor of the principle that all men are not created equal. 
in other words. The Supreme Court has come out in favor of, of slavery. At least that's how the South sees it. And so the South, being emboldened by the Supreme Court, um, they rush to the, the extreme. They, that, what I mean to say is they are no longer content with a candidate like Stephen Douglas, who right, is a defender of popular sovereignty, who argues that let the people decide whether or not to have slavery or not. By 1857, that no longer satisfies many in the Deep South who say, no, the Supreme Court has come out and told us, or again, so they think, slavery is, is right. right. So don't let the people decide. They can't decide. Let's spread slavery everywhere. Don't allow Congress to, to interfere with the spread of slavery into the territories. Don't let the people interfere with the spread of slavery in the territories. Um, Douglas's popular sovereignty position now is no longer acceptable to many in the Deep South because they believe the Supreme Court has just told them they have a right to their slaves, which popular sovereignty could deny um, through voting. And that's what will end up leading to the split in the Democratic Party in the election of 1860. So let's take us, take us to that point then, um, where we get to 1860. Um, the election is in the fall, of course. Um, but in the coming into the year of 1860, what you're telling us is you've got a country, maybe for the first time in our history, that is actually divided over the fundamental question whether slavery is right or wrong, right? Yeah. Even back in the 1800 and the divisions between Jefferson and Adams, both mm -hmm. Jefferson and Adams believed in principle, even Jefferson, a slave owner, believed in principle that slavery was wrong. Mm -hmm. And Jeff of course, and Adams thought the same thing. But now we have, by the time we get to 1860, a real divide over this fundamental question. Mm. Um, how does Lincoln become the nominee of the, of the Republican Party in 1860? Mm. And as some folks are asking already, again, great questions in, in, uh, coming from our uh, listeners. How does the Democratic Party split in 1860? Mm. Yeah, great question. So um, both major parties, Democrats and Republicans, they meet for their respective conventions in May of 1860. Uh, the election is scheduled for November 6th. Uh, the Democrats first, they meet in, in Charleston, South Carolina. Uh, the obvious candidate is, is Stephen A. Douglas. Um, but the South insisted that the party endorse in their party platform the principle that slavery was right. And that was voted down on the floor. And all hardline southern states end up withdrawing from the convention. And so the Democrats, they, they adjourn, and they end up reconvening in, in, in Baltimore, Maryland, uh, where they adopt their platform, which, you, uh, which, which, um, which our audience has, and they choose Douglas as their candidate. The hardline southerners, however, reject this, and they choose John Breckinridge of Kentucky as their candidate. So you now have two Democratic candidates. You have the Democratic Party now split between so sort of the more northern, moderate, popular sovereignty approach who, who end up backing Douglas versus the, the, the Deep South and those who support John Breckinridge and the principle that slavery is right and ought to be extended. Uh, at the same time, you've got a third party as well that you can't forget about, the Constitutional Union Party. Uh, composed of old line Whigs uh, who weren't Republicans and uh, know nothings, uh, who end up selecting John Bell of Tennessee for their for their candidate. Um, and by the way, interesting fact: his John Bell's running mate, um, especially right today, where running mates are all over the news now. Uh, John Bell. Even today, mate, they are right. That's right. That's right. John Bell's running mate uh, for the Constitutional Union Party uh, was Edward Everett. Uh, a Harvard professor who, in 1863, he'll deliver the main address at Gettysburg, um, at the, the Gettysburg Cemetery uh, in November of 1863. That main speech, that two-hour-long speech uh, that takes place right before Lincoln delivers his two-minute and much more famous Gettysburg address, where he locates the birth of the nation at four score and seven years ago, of course, in 1776 in the Declaration. Uh, Everett will write to Lincoln afterwards and he'll say, you know, my dear sir, I would flatter myself to think that I came as close to expressing the central idea of the occasion in two hours as you did in two minutes. 
Wow. So, so wow. Everett becomes a Lincoln fan, but he, he runs against him in the election of, of 1860 as the VP candidate for the Constitutional Union Party, who basically decided we're not going to take any stand on slavery. We are pro-Constitution, we're pro-Union, and that's all you need to know. But we're not going to tell you what the Constitution means. Okay. And then you have the Republicans who meet in Chicago of May of 1860. If they don't meet in Chicago, Lincoln probably is not the nominee. Because, of course, Chicago, this is, right, th this is Lincoln's home state. And so the convention is flooded with Lincoln supporters. Um, Lincoln wanted the nomination. There's no doubt about that. And he went after it with great political skill. The best book on this that I can recommend is Doris Kearns Goodwin, uh, her, her great book, Team of Rivals, uh, where Lincoln is able to sort of outmaneuver his other political rivals for the nomination. Of course, after he wins the election, he puts them all in his cabinet. Seward becomes Secretary of State, for example. Seward came into the convention. This was back before the candidates actually right, you know, arrived and gave big speeches, also before the age of campaigning. Uh, but uh, Seward is the favorite. Um, but he ends up losing support to Lincoln because everybody knew this is our opportunity. The Democrats are split. Right? So the presumption is whoever we nominate has a really, really good chance of winning the presidency. Um, the only way we can mess this up is if Douglas is somehow able to capture some northern states and nobody receives a majority in the Electoral College, and so then the election is thrown to the House of Representatives. Um, and Seward's extreme position, his irrepressible conflict uh, position was not seen as a political winner by, by many. He's, uh, Seward is ahead on the first two ballots, um, but his support begins to dwindle, and Lincoln is elected on the third ballot. Lincoln is elected on the third ballot as the compromise candidate. He's not an accidental president. Um, he's the, the compromise candidate between right, sort of the, those who would prefer Seward but also want to win. So even though Lincoln gave his House divided speech, and someone asked this, one of our listeners asked this, even though he gives the House divided speech, which says a House divided, quoting the Bible, mm -hmm. cannot stand. It'll be either be all slave or all free. Mm -hmm. um, even though he gives that speech, he's still regarded as less extreme on the slavery issue than Seward. Yeah, yeah, because I would, I would also call to mind the next line where he says, right, I do not expect the House to fall. I do not expect the union to be dissolved, but I do expect that it will become all one thing or all the other. Whereas Seward had called, said, I expect we might have a civil war. Yep. This is an irrepressible conflict. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. For, from Seward's perspective, or at least, right, how people were reading Seward's perspective was, right, this, is, this pot is bubbling over and it's, right, there's nothing we can do about it. So ballots are cast mm -hmm. in the states. Mm -hmm. Electoral votes are counted up. Mm -hmm. The Democrats, in fact, divide. Yep. Yep. Um, the Republicans managed to win enough states, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. So that Lincoln, it doesn't have to go to the House of Representatives. That's right. Unlike, unlike when mm -hmm. we were talking about last week, Professor Rogers and the election of 1800, which did. Yeah. Yes, this yes. Like it, this looked like it might actually go to the House of Representatives, but it doesn't. It doesn't, why, right. Why is Lincoln able to win? When it looked to a lot of people, when you're talking about four political parties and the country is divided and they're all located in, sections of the country where they could win states. Uh, someone in the, one of the questioners wants another great question. How is it then that Lincoln could actually win and become president? Yeah, no, great question. I mean, Lincoln doesn't even appear on the ballot in, in the South. He doesn't appear on the ballot in 10 Southern states. Um, of the 11 states that will eventually secede, uh, he's only on the ballot in one of them, Virginia. Um, he does not receive a majority in the popular vote Right, because there are four main candidates running, but he does get a plurality of the popular vote, so he gets roughly 40% of the popular vote. Uh, Douglas comes in second in the popular vote contest, 
But in terms of the Electoral College, Douglas comes in last. Uh, Douglas only wins Missouri and parts of New Jersey. New Jersey ends up splitting their seven electoral votes between Lincoln and, and Douglas. Um, Breckenridge wins the entire South, Deep South. Uh, Bell wins three states, uh, Virginia, Tennessee, and Kentucky. And Lincoln essentially sweeps the North with the exception of right, part of New Jersey going to Douglas and then the West. Um, and he is he 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 wins a majority in the electoral college. I think at that time you needed 152 electoral votes to get a majority. Lincoln got 180. Uh, and if you add up the electoral votes from the other three candidates, still even if they had all went to one candidate, still Lincoln wins the election in the electoral college. Um, Lincoln carries 18 states in comparison to Douglas's one, Breckenridge's 11. And Bell's three. What's the what's the reaction of the country upon learning that Lincoln has been elected president? <sighs> yeah. Um, well, in the South, it's alarm bells. Um, in in many of the southern states, um, conventions are convened. Delegates to those conventions are selected in order to determine the question of secession. And that happens first in South Carolina in December. South Carolina, which votes for secession on what, December 20th, right? So just a little over a month after Lincoln's election, uh, South Carolina declares that they're seceding from the union. And I, I, if, if we look at the, the documents for a moment, um, one of those documents was uh, South Carolina's Articles of Secession. Um, all the states that eventually seceded put out similar documents Seven states we know, of course, uh, will end up seceding from the Union, claiming they've left the Union between Lincoln's election on November 6th and then his inauguration on March 4th. Uh, and then after Lincoln calls for 75,000 troops after the fall of Fort Sumter in April, four more southern states will secede as well for a total of, of 11. Um, but looking at that document from South Carolina and many other, like I said, all the other southern states who seceded put out similar documents, there's, they, they explain why they are seceding, why they are leaving the Union, so-called. And what we see there is their only reason is slavery. Slavery is mentioned in, explicitly in almost all of the the Articles of Secession from all of the states. In South Carolina, Mississippi, Georgia, Virginia, Alabama, Texas, all of them mention slavery explicitly. This is why we're leaving. Uh, Arkansas doesn't mention slavery, but they do mention the election of Lincoln as the cause. Um, there's no mention of slavery or Lincoln in uh, states like Louisiana, Florida, North Carolina, or Tennessee. But in the Articles of Secession that those states put out, it was basically just right, a couple of sentences saying pretty much we're leaving, bye bye And that's it. Um, but in these Articles of Secession, they say we're leaving because of slavery. Um, and they point back to the Declaration of Independence. And they talk about the right of right, people to form new governments. They talk about the right of consent. They talk about the right of revolution. Um, but one thing that none of them mention not one of them mentions from the Declaration of Independence that principle of equality, that apple of gold, as Lincoln called it. And if you look at the Republican Party platform, that's one of the very first things the Republicans mention, right? We stand for this natural Republican majority on the basis of the Declaration's principle that all men are created equal. So you get, so Lincoln, and in the North, there is the belief that, well, Lincoln's president, but this isn't necessarily going to lead to civil war. Somehow we can hold this together. Yeah. Is that right? And because I'm thinking about the other documents you gave us, Lincoln begins to realize the enormity of the task. Once the states start to secede, and you have a, you've given us a couple of readings of speeches of his from February, for example, the month before he becomes president, states have started to secede. Um, what? Well, how is this weighing on Lincoln's mind? Uh, and, and, and what do we see in those speeches about, uh, and I was particularly struck by the, the phrase that he says, um, I have a, ta a task more difficult than that which devolved on General Washington. 
Yeah. So Lincoln says you said Washington was his, you know, his uh, her hero uh, as a po politician and statesman. But now Lincoln says, but my task is even greater than the first president's. Um, yeah. what, what, what do we see in those speeches? What's Lincoln's feeling as he goes to become president after the election? Does he really think he can hold the country together? And, and we see some of that, I guess, that argument in the first inaugurals, which you also had us take a look at. Yeah, great question. Again, um, after Lincoln is elected, uh, he doesn't say anything. Right? People are clamoring around Lincoln's right, you know, give us, give us a, give us a response. What are you, what are, what are you thinking here? Now that these states are claiming to secede because of your election, right? Give us, give us a statement. Tell us something. Tell us what you think. And, and his response was always, read my speeches. Right? Everything you need to know is is already there. I've I've said everything that that I want to say. And so Lincoln is is silent during that period, pretty much from his election to his inauguration, um, up until he ends up leaving Springfield. And on the train ride from Springfield to to Washington, he delivers a series of speeches. And so what you quoted from there, that was his farewell address at at Springfield, where he says, you know, I now leave with a task before me greater than that which rested upon General Washington. Um, and I take him to mean something like what he had explained in his famous July 4th address, where he says, right, our, our political experience, right, this has often been called an experiment. We've proved two things so far in our history. Um, the successful founding and administering of the Republican form of government by the people. We have yet to prove the successful maintenance of that experiment to maintain Right, the capacity of the people for self-government, as uh, Publius put it in the Federalist Papers. Um, and so he, de he delivers these series of short speeches on the way to D.C. And I, I, I love that speech there at Independence Hall. He stops there in Philadelphia at Independence Hall, the site of the, the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution. And he says there, I've never had a feeling politically that did not spring from the sentiments embodied in the Declaration of Independence. And he says, right, I was elected upon that basis, on that sentiment, and I would rather be assassinated on the spot than give that up. Wow, that's prophetic. It is. It is. And then, of course, his first inaugural address, March 4th, 1861, Lincoln's first significant statement, right, on everything that's been going on in the country since his election, where right, seven southern states claim to have seceded from the Union. They, they, they claim that right now the Union is dissolved. Um, in Lincoln's inaugural, which is part political treatise on um, the nature and history of the Union and why the Union is perpetual and indissoluble and why the South can't really leave the Union and the Union is unbroken, as he put it and as he always believed. Um, but it's also part um, the main purpose is to try to persuade the South not to initiate civil war to try to find some grounds for peaceful reconciliation without war. Um, and it's in that speech, right? He, he directs it to all those who, who really love the Union. He calls them our, my fellow countrymen. He tries to persuade the South not to leave, not to initiate civil war, because as he says at the end, right, basically the choice for civil war rests upon your shoulders, not mine. You have not taken an oath before God to dissolve this government, while I have taken the most solemn one to preserve, protect, and defend it. And then there's that famous line, which I, if I, if I, I could, where he says this. This is where Lincoln, the poet, really is, is on display. I am loath to close. We are not enemies, but friends. We must not be enemies. Though passion may have strained, it must not break our bonds of affection. The mystic cords of memory stretching from every battlefield and patriot grave to every living heart and hearthstone all over this broad land will yet swell the chorus of the union when again touched as surely they will be by the better angels of our nature. This appeal to the, the better angels of our nature. Um, if we're to judge this speech on Lincoln's success in persuading the South not to leave, it's an abject failure. 
I'm not saying it, the speech was an abject failure, but if its purpose was to prevent the South or to persuade the South not to leave, of course he is unsuccessful in that. And civil war looms in the distance in the very near future after this speech. Tell us a little bit about now Lincoln is elected. Even this speech is not successful. In the beginning of his administration, we could talk so much about his time as president, of course, mm -hmm. but he assembles what you or what Doris uh, Kearns Goodwin calls a team of rivals, mm -hmm. and he picks people who were his strongest opponents, mm -hmm. but very ambitious, very capable people mm -hmm. to be part of his cabinet. Mm -hmm. Tell us a little bit about Lincoln. You talked about Lincoln, the poet, and his amazing mastery of the English language, which mm -hmm. he got from Shakespeare mm -hmm. and the King James Bible, among other things. Tell us a little bit now um, about Lincoln, the politician, mm. um, and putting this cabinet together. And I'm always reminded of once the Civil War starts, people find him not only reading Shakespeare out loud in the Oval Office, mm. but telling jokes. Mm. We think of Lincoln, the poet, but we always don't often think of Lincoln being funny. Mm. How does he put this cabinet together? And someone asked in the, in the com, uh, one of our listeners asked, what role does humor play mm. in, in Lincoln, the politician? Mm. Yeah, that's that's a great great question. Um, his uh, his cabinet really was a, a team of rivals. One rival that didn't make it into his cabinet though was Stephen Douglas. Um, but Douglas, a Northern Democrat, very pro Union, he is present at Lincoln's inauguration. And when Lincoln goes to deliver that speech, right, he goes up to the podium, he he puts his speech down before him, and he takes off his hat, right, the famous stovepipe hat, and he goes to set it down, but there's no place to set his hat down. And from the crowd behind him, Stephen Douglas steps forward, takes Lincoln's hat, and stands there holding Lincoln's hat while he delivers that, that first inaugural. Wow. Mm. Yeah. Um, everybody in Lincoln's cabinet thought they could do a better job than Lincoln. Everybody thought that Lincoln wasn't up to the task, that he was in over his head, that he was this country bumpkin, right, who just, you know, told, you know, told a bunch of funny stories, told jokes, uh, enjoyed the laugh, uh, who was too hopeful while the country was falling about his ears. All of them thought they could do a better job than Lincoln. But after time, every single one of them realized that they could not match Lincoln's political statesmanship, that none of them could match Lincoln's prudence or his wisdom or his understanding of the, the American people. And they weren't, they weren't nearly as funny as Lincoln either. You don't want to hear <laughs> Sam and Chase tell a joke. I don't think that man ever told a joke in his life. <laughs> <laughs> let, let me ask you this question in closing, Jason. That's a great statement. There's a wonderful speech by Frederick Douglass with whom Lincoln had a, a black man, an abolitionist, of course, famous. And Lincoln, he said uh, of Lincoln, he was the only white man he ever met who treated him as an equal. Um, uh, Lincoln, tell us that he, Douglass gives an oration about Lincoln where he says he knew the American people better than they knew themselves. Yeah. yeah. What and you just said that there. Mm -hmm. What did Lincoln understand about the American people that sustained him through the election of 1860 and through the terrible Civil War? Yeah, that's 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 a great question. Um, we've been talking a lot about Lincoln's deeds and his and his speeches, Lincoln's words, and it's it's Lincoln's words that have always been that have always impressed me the most. I, you know, I just, whenever I'm feeling down or maybe, you know, a little pessimistic about, you know, the, you know, our, 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 our future political prospects, I, I take down Lincoln. I read from Lincoln. The more time I spend with him, the more I, the more I read of Lincoln, the more I fall in love uh, and the more hopeful I become because he really did seem to understand what was essential about America. And he did that through linking, linking, the nation's present to its past. Linking 1860 or 1863 at Gettysburg, for example, back to 1776, four score and seven years ago. The man's words, I mean, his monument in Washington, D.C., he's surrounded by his words, right? You have the Gettysburg Address and the second inaugural etched into stone. 
you don't see monuments like that anywhere else in the world. You only see that in the United States where we surround our heroes with their own words, right? That's a distinctly American thing. That's an American invention because America is the first country in the history of the world founded upon words. That's not to say, of course, that actions aren't important. But America is the first nation founded upon words, these words. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. These words, four score and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth on this continent a new nation conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. And by the way, I learned that from my old prof professor, my beau ideal of a teacher, Peter Schramm. So Lincoln knew what the American people might have forgotten in the 1850s, but they, he reminded them again in the election of 1860 and throughout his presidency that the, the fundamental principles that hold us together are these principles from the Declaration of Independence. And we can't lose those. We have to keep those alive. And as you say, a part of his statesmanship really was to keep reminding the American people of what, how important they were and what they mean. Yeah, yeah that's wonderful. Jason, exactly thank right. you. Thank you. This The time has flown by as it, it always does, but really particularly tonight. It's so great to, that you could join us, my friend. Um, and I want to thank all of you who have, are joining us uh, from around the country, students, teachers, citizens. Thanks again to the Missouri, to Missouri Humanities for their uh, partnership in promoting this conversation. Uh, Missouri Humanities, as I mentioned last week, offers a number of programs, uh, free virtual opportunities to learn about uh, German, Native American, and Civil War heritage throughout the upcoming year. So please visit MissouriHumanities.org to connect to the people and places and ideas that shape society. They're doing such good work there. Uh, please connect with them. And thank you for joining us. To learn more about Ashbrook, uh, as I said last week, Ashbrook.org, our website, tells us all about what we're doing for students, teachers, and citizens, for teachers out there, Many of you know Teaching American History or TAH.org, wonderful resources, primary source documents of the kind we were talking about tonight are there for you, for teachers, for parents, grandparents who may even be homeschooling again this fall. If that's your situation, take a look at TAH.org. It's a wonderful resource. Uh, you'll be sent a link of, uh, to the recording of today's webinar. Please uh, send that out as far and wide as you like. We'd love to have folks um, Participate with us even just by viewing this afterwards. Send it out to your children, grandchildren, friends, teachers, etc. Uh, the next webinar will be next Tuesday night, same time, same place, uh, August 18th. It will be talking about Ronald Reagan and the election of 1980. Again, focusing on these historic, seminal elections in our country's history. Because it's Ashbrook's idea, our fundamental conviction, that we can learn from history. We can learn to get some historical light, as, as Professor Stevens was helping us with today, on our contemporary circumstances, but also renew our own understanding of America's principles. And when we do that, as, as Professor Stevens said, we gain hope. We gain hope from that insight. So as always, please, until next week, stay healthy, stay hopeful, and stay connected with Ashbrook. Thank you. <laughs>